So how many people actually know what responsive design is? Okay, cool. Go over uh, who the heck I am. Basically uh, 15 a years. Maybe? Oh, <laughs> she's gonna hand that to me. That's actually a... Is that better? No, yes? No. Okay, turn it on. We had on, it is on, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is not that good user experience. Hello. Of course, you left. <laughs> You're in here. Anything? Anything? No. <clears throat> we'll call her now. Okay, I guess I'll speak up because you said the battery's low on that. All right, uh, where was I? Um, so, 15 years, design, interactive, development, design, mainly design, uh, master's in HCI, which is human computer interaction. Um, bachelor's in visual design from uh, Kendall College of Art and Design up in Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I'm usually originally from. But uh, I've been eight years as a creative director, design director, whatever type of role you know, that is, but basically as a creative director. Produced web, mobile, and digital solutions for Fortune 100s, 200s, 300s, and your regular mom and pop places. Um, pretty much any type of level of design of website, interactive CDs, DVDs, way back when. Uh, dad of four and a half kids, one on the way in, in June, and then uh, intrepid outdoorsman if I even had time to do that. So, responsive design. I will go, uh, you know, kind of through what what responsive web design is for the people who don't know. Spend a little time on that. I'm going to try and talk as much as I can about how to, you know, design for it, what to keep in mind. I'm not going to touch on the dev, uh, other than mentoring uh, media queries and some you know, items like that, frameworks, but you know, that's, I don't have time for everything to get everything. I also won't have time for every single nuance of every design of like where to place content. I'll spend time on navigation and some other areas, but I can't go through everything. That'd be like a whole weekend if I tried to cover everything. So if you visited websites on a smartphone, like iPhone, like a, you know, iPhone, Android, everything, you're probably used to seeing the regular desktop version. Uh, through about pretty much the last you know, five years, people are starting to catch on having mobile sites. But you know, with a regular desktop version on your phone, everything's shrunk down to a smaller size and you have to zoom in to read, to read any of the text. Now, you've also maybe seen the mobile versions of the website. Uh, you don't have to zoom into the mobile phone to get that content, but you also may not get the content that's on the full website. So starting way back, go back in time when there was really uh, you know, something called the internet that everybody was getting on and uh, Napster was king and you know, it could download a picture for like 30 to 60 seconds which was torture to a 14 year old. <laughs> then everything was fixed. It was uh, easy and predictable. You know, you could easily design for a website, mostly text heavy because it would just download the text easily and it just took for a while, colors. Then came the one, are we good? January 9th, 2007. Can you hear me? Okay. Wow. <laughs> All right, so cue the John Williams score. Our lives, our lives changed. Perhaps not for the better. <laughs> but the effects have been startling. Human consumption of data or cat memes have uh, you know, we've been barked on a new frontier. Right now, as of uh, February 2014, 85% of web devices are mobile. <clears throat> and a collective WTF moment hit when that phone came out, and the internet basically pooped out dollar signs. As I've stated, devices have changed our lives. We all know this, so if you don't know, you can leave. Uh, you know, need I explain what the iPad did? And holy crap, those are some crisp icons with the retina display, and you kind of want to lick them all. <laughs> now, there are all these different devices that can use access to the internet. Smartphones, phablets, feature phones, tablets, laptops, 
e-readers, and as my dad has brought up many times, you know, he never thought you'd have a computer in your pocket. So if I was to say that this is a plethora of screens, what would you say? No, three amigos? No? Okay, sorry. So here's some more statistics to show you that I look things up. Uh, that's a lot of hipsters, and that's a lot of people that hate Steve Jobs. <laughs> but the most glaring issue is that the web is no longer a desktop accessible thing. It's not just desktop. And what we've come to know as mobile is no longer a separate state of being. Oh, yeah. So why you're, what you're here for is, uh, like I said, to go through at a high level how you can design a usable, accessible, and freaking gorgeous website that will work on all devices, everything, anything, completely device agnostic. You have four options. And those four options will give uh, each some sort of solution, but there are just as beavers to each of those solutions. Something we hate, want to drop kick, like Jack Black style out of the window. You have designing for the desktop. And as I said, it's too small to show up on, a, on your regular screen. If you've got a phablet, maybe, got a tablet, you can still see it, but you know, they might have drop downs. Drop downs don't necessarily work all the time and it just doesn't get the best user experience. And there's a separate mobile site. That was the most popular for a while, but again, a lot of issues. Has, they have their own separate design. Maybe the branding doesn't go over. Uh, you also, for CMS, you might have two different logon, logons for it. You get the logon for the Android or for the de desktop to change out any pictures, to change any content. Then you have to log back in to on a different CMS to change on the mobile. Very, very frustrating. Then there's the native mobile app. Yes, everybody wants a freaking app. But who's going to have you know 20,000 apps on their phone? You know, usually we use about 15 apps the most. Then there's responsive design. So desktop design, you know, that's it. It's four desktops. This is what you get when you see the New York Times on your phone. Imagine they have a mobile site, and I think they have an uh, app. I actually use a CN app mostly because I don't like their app. But uh, I could not find a link from it from their home page. And it seems okay, but it's still really tiny. So when you zoom in, so that the, uh, so that the text is actually large enough to read, this is what you get. It's pretty hard to read once you can't even see a full line of text all at once. They don't even have wrapping on their text. Then there's the uh, mobile separate design, the m.blah whatever site. And uh, here's the usa.gov mobile site. Doesn't look too bad, very clean, and the navigation is easy to understand. But when you go to the usa.gov website, there's a crap load of more content. And if you're viewing the mobile site, you don't have access to it. So neither of those options were the right answer, but web designers have tried out a lot of different ideas, techniques, and are looking for a better solutions to the challenges, challenges of designing for mobile phones. <coughs> In 2010, a web designer uh, named uh, Ethan Marcotte put together a few different techniques into something he called responsive design and started to catch on. Responsive as web design often offers us a way to forward a way forward, finally, allowing us to design for the ebb and flow of things that you want to put on a website. On a responsive site, the browser responds to the size of the screen and displays the content in a way that it is appropriate for that screen size. But it's only one website, one set of code, and one set of content, so there's no separate sites or anything else. Going deeper is that web, uh, web responsive de design is a collection of techniques that allow your website to respond to the device that is being viewed on. Here's an example. There are uh, basically two breakpoints, and I'll get to what breakpoints are if you don't know, but it's a you know, very clean, intuitive, and brand smart website. Everything's consistent across the board. Here's another example that delivers everything you want for every situation. Advantages of responsive design, go over these quickly, that there is a consistent experience. You don't have to worry about different things popping up in different places or having to figure out how to design for two different screens. So you're pretty much figuring out where to place the content. Content parity, 
I'll get into what that is more in depth, but it's basically that all the content pairs equally on the same user experience. No zooming. You don't have to keep you know, you know, pinching and <coughs> all the different movements on the page. Single code base, and also for a user, you see most users, like I said, one login. And it's device agnostic, so it doesn't care what device it's on, it will show up perfectly on that screen, pixel perfect. Easier URL management, so if you have all the different URLs moving through the website, you know, you have, you're getting into an e-commerce site, there's a, a trillion different URLs is way easier to manage. But the disadvantage of responsive design is that it's hard to realize the context of usage of that website and the device. Does everybody can still hear me on this thing? Okay. I kind don't of hear myself up there, so. Also, I take into account speed and bandwidth with media, web, or sorry, media, videos, animations, and you know, flash doesn't show up on most iPhones, even though, unless you want to get a third party. <laughs> Advertising, many times you want to advertise separately for a mobile user than you do a web user. Sorry, a desktop user. Or maybe you don't, but that's something you need to take into account. There can be disadvantages when you have those different types of, uh, of advertisements and also those metrics that you need to report on. The workflow or user flow or how you develop and how people go through the site may be different. They, you may want them to go to a different page when they're on their phone than you do when they're on the desktop. Project management for a responsive site is a little bit more in depth. You know, there's a lot more planning, excruciating planning, and I'll use excruciating later because it's the only way to do it the best way. So web design has also never been some someone just learns and is all of a sudden the gatekeeper. There is no Dana only Zool. You, you basically have to have the PhD in keeping with the best practices and the changing technology. We all design our own way, or all or, or developers design, you know, develop their own way, but there's, it's always ever-changing, especially with HTML5 being living code, always something new to learn. So with that, how do you choose to utilize a responsive design? You need to take into account, from a very basic level, are you creating a content site or a transactional site? Again, the context of use. Where are they going to be using the site? Where do you plan on them using the site? Do you think they're going to be looking at your site from more from their phone? Or do you think they're going to be wanting to sit down and explore more on a desktop or tablet? Are they going to sit down at home at dinner and pop it open and say, hey, I'm going to look at the site here. Where do you think they're going to be looking at your site more? Resources. Do you have the bodies to create a responsive site? Someone who knows the HTML, someone who knows the CSS3, who has that knowledge. Everybody's trying to learn as fast as they can, but a lot of people specialize in it. Some of them still be like, you know, I know HTML4 or standard HTML, but I just have not picked up HTML5 yet. So designers, are they available to, or able to look at the content and be like, yes, I know how to transition this content to this device or not? And then you can also get into content people. So thinking about all the different people that are involved and the transitions, yes. Hold, hold, hold. Well, sir? I think so. Although I, you're right here, so. I was like, I, you know, I can't even hear, so. I'm <coughs> gonna... I think it's dead again. Is it? Yeah, it's dead. All right, I'll try and speak up. You're actually doing great. Okay. <laughs> Any people in the back can hear me? All right. What about that one? She said that one doesn't work. <laughs> it's really fall. Dang. Okay. So, I said so a lot already. Um, CMS. Can your CMS handle? A responsive site can it handle the framework? Can it handle the code? Can it handle the users not knowing what the hell to do? <laughs> and also, with native apps don't just do freaking native app because they want you to. Think about their users, think about the usage, and, and tell them say, you don't need a native app now. You, you can, if you want that, you can phone get it, but rather just you know, look at a responsive, talk them into it. It's a much easier way to go. Things to consider before I start getting into an actual like, design process and everything else. There is a deeper level of things to consider. Look at the device and browser support, i.e. 8 blows, i.e. 9 is better. <laughs> what? Barely. IE sucks. Always has. Pretty much. I, it always does. Always has. You know, thank God they rid of Netscape, but you know, I, there's still IE. Um, Chrome, always updates. That's, that's better. I prefer Firefox, but you know, obviously if you're a designer developer, you probably use every single browser out there, and you should. I mean, that's what I, when I interview, 
I say, okay, what browser do you use? And they say one, then I don't hire them. <laughs> I can be an asshole. Um, test on real devices. Make sure you're testing on everything that you can get. Uh, any Windows phone, yes? Test on a Windows phone. Test on an Android. Test on all the tablets you can get. Test on different computers, different speeds, different processors. Test in real life, everyday scenarios. When I was developing Sony's website as a responsive website, it was a brand website, a crap load of content. I mean, it's, it's Sony. And we need to, we need to have, you know, transition all that content onto a responsive website. So we actually prototyped using Axure, and I'm gonna plug in Axure many times because I think it's an awesome piece of software. Um, we use Axure, we created a prototype that we put on different devices. And we'd actually walk around the city of LA or Seattle, wherever we were testing, and have people look at that and click at it. Click on it, you know, see them walk on the street, on the L, on any of the tra you know, public transportations, in meetings, and at work. And we were testing in real life everyday scenarios so that we get excellent feedback and people just, just sitting in a lab going, oh, I think this. It's not, I, don't, I actually don't like labs. Speed bamboo, again, third time. Take into account that they're on their phone. They may not always have 4G, they may be on 3G, they may be on some other crappy, you know, less worse than 3G. Think small screen first. This will be beating in your heads. Start with mobile. Because that's where you know how much content you want to fit. So you're not slamming people over the face or over the head with different too much content. Let content determine the design. Don't have someone say, oh, just lower mips in it and come up with design. When you're doing responsive, you need to be working with content people iteratively, communicating with the client, which I'm going to get into, so that the content will drive your design. And then let the design from the content determine the breakpoints of where you want content to change when you are resizing. Always consider UX and business goals first. Please consider UX. And communicate with your clients. Things fall through the cracks way too much, especially when you're saying, it's going to move here, it's going to move here, it's going to move here. But then they're like, okay, you told us that, but then you need to show them. Wireframe, prototype, and be like, okay, this is exactly how it's going to move so that your ass is covered. No one's going to get fired because something didn't move correctly. And they're like, no, I wanted this to be up here, not there. And then the responsive workflow. You need to think about how the users are going to move and where the comp components are going to go so that they can get to all the content. The ingredients, again, I, I'm not going to take time to go through the code. There's a million different code snippets that I could go through, all the media queries, that'd be for a whole other discussion. Uh, but the main parts are a flexible grid-based layout. You should, all designers should know about grids. You shouldn't have to go through that, but you know, websites are based off of their grids and how the content is, fits within those grids. Flexible images and media either make it so that the images can uh, resize, like shrink to the device, or that you actually load a different image. Either way is fine. There hasn't been a lot of best practices on which way is the best. And if someone knows one that works better, and I, you know, feel free to speak up because I haven't found one that actually has been like the all or nothing way to go. <coughs> Immediate queries. The uh, module from the CSS3 specification basically is what says, I'm on this device, you need to show it this type of resolution so it looks perfect, or as close to perfect. Um, also, with this, keep in mind, mobile first equals content first equals the user first. Uh, the design process. There isn't one yet. It's so new. Every different company is going to have their own documentation on how they want to work through this. Some people like waterfall project management or software development for um, responsive. I find it fits a lot better in agile development in that there's more iterations, you can look at the content, you can work back and forth, you can try things, test, and then be like, oh man, that screwed up, we need to jump back and do something else. And also, there are just too many cooks in the kitchen, gurus, blowhards, and experts that say that this is the way to go. I am perfectly comfortable saying, I don't know the perfect way for a design process. It all matters on the everybody involved. Think of it as peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Everybody gives their little bits to the one big project. It's not going to exist without it. And like I said, designing and developing work amazingly together in an agile and uh, agile environment for a responsive uh, website. So to begin a responsive website is to think about the content. 
what we are able to do much more concisely is recognize content parity, parity, which is the idea that everybody should have access to the same content, no matter what device they're using to access the website. For example, because a consumer reports site, the recalls and uh, safety section is very important if you need information about recalled products. I mean, you go there and be like, you know, is my car seat gonna kill my kid? But when I try to find that content on a mobile consumer web report site, nothing, not even there. Scroll down to the bottom. There's a helpful sounding link like, can't find what you're looking for. So uh, maybe that's what I need. Maybe it'll take me to a site map or something. Something that'll lead me to where I want to go. This is where it takes you. Look at number two. Very helpful. That's awesome. Really, it's awesome. And, um, Go, there you go. So something to wrap your head around is 17% of cell phone owners in the United States access the internet mostly from their phones. And that's growing. And this is just as of last year. They haven't released of how many people are on it right now. You can't assume that people only do basic tasks on their phones and do everything else from their desktop computers later. So example is a guy go. Jumped on there to I paid my uh, car insurance. You know, help a uh, nice little link right there. So to make a payment, next page is completely unnecessary and ugly. Then you go to this page and okay, it's clear, concise, you can get to what you want. What I really like is that you don't need your username, password, or account number, especially when you're, when you're doing something quick. You're like, you just want to get and get the bill paid because I need to get to this next meeting or I need to go pick up my kids from soccer or something. You just jump in your phone number, zip code, and uh, you'll always the stupid verifications, but you know, you need them. Because, you know, who else is going to come into your account to pay your bill? So I thought, i check if they had the same option on their mobile site. Get to the site, this is the first thing that comes up. Download the app. Well, for, my, for all intents and purposes, I didn't want to download it right now. And I actually don't use Geico. But I just wanted to check that out. Get to this website, the mobile site. Ridiculous usage of stars. <laughs> I relate to Geico. <laughs> I have nothing else to say to that. Um, <laughs> I was to be like, you know, I guess that you could log in. Maybe there's a payment option there. But I was trying to see if there's anywhere else besides my back. So I'll scroll down. You know, boat insurance, awesome. I don't own a boat, but uh, <laughs> like maybe the explore guy can give me something. Oh, social networks. Not at all what I'm looking for. So. I don't have an option to pay my bill on here other than click on desktop site, and we know what that's going to do. It'll take you to their desktop site, and then it's going to load slow or not show up right on the screen. Context of use. Another important user experience consideration is the context of use. This refers to the conditions under which the website is being used. That's the definition by the you know UX guy who created the UX term, which is a very buzzworthy term. But um, You'll hear people talk about mobile context, but it's more complicated than that in that not all people using mobile devices are out running around somewhere. And not all people using desktops are, and laptops are sitting behind a desk. Some people are actually running around when they're using their mobile devices. They may be sitting on the sofa at home browsing Disney.com, buying tickets or something with a family. I have no idea what the hell they're doing, or especially the guy on the left, but they're not running around. Uh, and it can be surprising what people are doing on the phones. So just as there isn't one, only one context for use for people with mobile devices, uh, there isn't only one context for desktop and laptop people. You know, you're in a hotel. Who've been in a hotel and it's incredibly slow? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So you're waiting for a page to load up and you're like, I just want to purchase a different hotel. Um, for, uh, Sorry, for a second. Okay. Um, you also can't make assumptions about the screen sizes on a desktop because they may have a small phone, the computer. They may still have a netbook, for Christ's sake. You know, so they, I don't know who still has one of those, but they may have one. Um, and while a home user may not even, or may have a huge monitor, so a disparity between so many different devices, desktops, screen resolutions, it's ridiculous. I mean, you see people up there with like five different uh, computer screens. I have a developer who has that. I don't know why he needs that many, but he's good, so I say yes. 
And there are different ways to put together a responsive design. The best way, mobile first. You can try the other way. You may like it. But we've found, especially at SiteWorks, where we report ourselves as responsive experts, and that's all we sell, pretty much, or try to sell to everybody that we work with is responsive. Designing for the small screen first forces you to focus on the content and decide what's really important, even if you're not a guest. I don't, is it my allowed to ask questions? You may, okay. yeah. Is it because <clears throat> basically with mobile, you're forced to focus and edit and put in what's important and not? Correct, yeah, because you want to think about, you now if you're, you want to get people to come in and look at your site. It's all goes into strategy uh, for the company, how they want to appear to, the, to their uh, customers and clients and everybody. But you know, they may want to use a lot of images, but you, you'll get a lot of, most of the time you'll get a lot of content and copy. They'll just give you crap load of copy and you're like, there's no way I'm gonna fit this on a little phone. So that's when you choose, you know, you look at headlines. That's when you pick out other different, kind of just like snippets and just drop those in. But what you can do is on a mobile phone, have it be just four, like four words. But then when it you know, goes out bigger, it's those four words plus another eight and then another little uh, paragraph below. So that's what you think, is you think of what's the minimum you wanna do. Start there, and then you can expand on that. Because if you start <coughs> big, and now you're like, oh crap, I wanna shrink. I have way too much stuff on here. Right? And then, then you start getting convoluted. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the Washington Post realized this. Their mobile website is uh, much simpler, cleaner, straightforward. It only has the information you actually want. It comes up right away. You can download you know, their app, obviously, right up on top, which is always nice if you want it. If you're going to the site, you might be interested. And you get the main headline for that appeared on their website. And you can scroll down to see more. But then again, who's going to want to see all the content on their home page, on a desktop, on their mobile phone. I counted 184 text links. And that's not including the images or ads. So again, how would you, you know, how would you transfer that all into mobile? That's where it gets very, very difficult because they're not going to want to get to all that. So too much inf visual information thrown at me personally gives me a major headache. Take this mobile use case, also about simplicity. And why is it easier to do a transaction on a mobile phone rather than on a bank's regular website? I mean, I jump on my Chase mobile and I can do things twice as fast. I can transfer money, do everything I want really quickly. And I go on the website and it feels like it's two or three more steps. That's why you need to make it work for everyone. So when you're doing a responsive website, you need to account for the lowest common denominator. Now, don't, I'm not talking about like intelligence, just someone who want, who's moving fast, must get through it as quick as possible, or someone who wants to explore. So you need to think about, okay, well, I want it to be simple so I can give them all the content so that they can get to what they want, but if they want to get to the most recent headline, they get to that first, because that's, that's the first thing they want. Here's some examples that I think have worked. United Pixel Works is an e-commerce site. <coughs> Uh, not responsive sites are all content based rather than functionality based. You can scroll down to see the various products that are featured on the front page and when the screen gets wider everything rearranges so you can see more at once. And at full width you have a beautiful layout but it's the exact same content that you saw at the narrowest width. You won't be missing anything if you go to this site from your mobile phone at all. WWF sites, I picked this because my daughter's obsessed with it, with animals in general, as uh, a site that uh, you know, utilizes beautiful photography. I've done a lot of hotel websites because I was at Travel Pick for a, short, for a period of time, and that's all they do is hotels. Nothing sells an experience like photography, and they utilize it very well. I mean, you're going for this to learn about, you know, to learn about the animals that they're protecting. So they don't want to waste time by giving a bunch of small little images and a bunch of copy. They hit you with some you know, pretty gorgeous photography. At desktop size, there's space to make the main photo even bigger. There's still room to show additional photos below. Also, with responsive design, there is no fold. It's breakpoints. We're seeing the end of the fold. So if you still hear people talking about fold, feel free to correct them. Have them email me if they think there is one, because I will Debate it till I'm blue in the face. There's no more fold. Uh, so basically, as a, with this, you'll see the same content here on a mobile phone or a huge monitor. 
and you'll just be able to see more without scrolling. Now this is a company that sells surfboards. I don't surf, but I just thought it was a cool usage of the picture. And that instead of the making, making the picture change size, they just show more of the picture. Responsive design gives you a ton of options, especially with rotators and HTML5 sliders. HTML5 sliders are awesome, awesome things coming out, and they don't increase your speed or decrease your speed of your load time barely at all, if at all. On mobile? On mobile. On both, actually. <coughs> um, the uh, University of Chicago has a lot of information on their website. By uh, designing from the small si screen size first, they were able to make sure the most important content appears at the top of the screen. And on a desktop screen, you see the same content, but there is room for some additions, such as a subcaption on, on the uh, main photo, and the text isn't an integral part of the content, so it was hidden at the narrow width to save space. So you see there's less, a lot less content. They give you good, nice size images for your, for your thumb to hit until you get some intrigue. It's a very, very minimal copy below. When you jump in here, it's, pretty, it's very similar, but just with a less added touch with some of the text. From these websites, you probably have noticed that they're clean. They're uncluttered. With responsive design, you don't want to use a lot of imagery. You can use a lot of the really cool CMS, uh, CSS3 attributes, rounded corners. I guess you could use soft shadows, though we're seeing in design trends, soft shadows are the way of the dinosaur. Uh, but from what we've seen, compare that to the uh, Washington Post site we looked at earlier, and you know, which is the better user experience. So, I did it again, I said so. Uh, since the same website, no matter what you're viewing it at, the branding and the look and feel are consistent across all devices. This often isn't the, the case with separate mobile sites. And actually, I've had the bad situation where I was working with another agency, we were both two vendors on one project, and they picked up one of the websites for Adidas. Um, we were actually able to get them fired over this because they had two teams, two separate teams working on the mobile and the desktop version. And they didn't communicate well. So when the Adidas got, it was, it was a separate uh, site for Adidas, when they got the designs, they looked completely different. That was a, that's a big no-no, especially for web. With the responsive design, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, there's more content on the page of this width, and you see additional elements just in the navigation, but it still looks and feels exactly like the mobile version. An Emerald site does an excellent job of presenting menus so they're easily viewable on a small screen. You have to scroll down quite a ways to see everything, but that's okay. People are very, very used to their thumbs. I think the thumbs, thumb muscles are going through the roof right now because people are sitting there and like this all day long. And yes, people do talk about thumb fatigue, but I think that's some way to get another vaccine or something. That desktop width, the menu layout is different, and they've added pictures for the three menu types at the top, uh, which is an enhance enhancement, and mobile users don't see the pictures, but that's okay, because they aren't an essential part of the message. It's just something you can do better when you want to show something on the desktop. Bottom line, it's about the user. Always about the user and how the content's going to get to them. Oops, went too fast. So, give everybody the same content when it comes to responsiveness, what you're doing. You're displaying it appropriately for the device, and no, no matter device what they have. So the backwards, no matter what device they have. Content drives the layout. Fourth, fourth or fifth time I've said that. How much text you need, the headers, images, videos, multimedia, advertising, it all needs to be accounted for, audited, and planned excruciatingly. Style tiles. This is what you would use to start designing. You can buy several different plans. If you are strictly a designer, if you're working in Photoshop or things, you can, buy, you can find these for free. People post are there how they create themselves, or you can create your own. First one is mostly fluid, in that everything just pretty much just goes to where you want it to go in a fluid motion. You have the column drop, where is you're, you're built very much in columns. You know, you do this for blogs, blog type sites, or newspapers, um, and that everything's built in columns. And as, as you move down, the column just drops below. A layout shifter. 
you know, if you uh, you can do this if you have advertisements on the site. So, um, or you have a gallery or something. You have it laid out one way. You go smaller, and then you can have it just move. You can have it even jump to another side. You can have it jump below. You can have it jump to the top. Um, or if you have an advertisement here, you can have it, um, you know, shrink down, move over here, move to the top, or completely disappear. Off canvas. I mean, this is actually how a lot of the um, just the UIs of your phone work. Now, there's things that exist outside. So if you think of it, you know, like it's a four-dimensional world, you have existing screens all around your one screen. And that you slide over or select a button and it brings it over. This is just another way to have your website in that you can, like with a slider, you can slide it and it comes, boom, comes in, comes in or goes back. Here's some examples of some styles tiles that we that I use on a old project. These are three samples of what we created for them of just just styles for um, style like kind of like kind of like style sheets, but we delivered this to them saying, "Here's you, know, you have your election head that is going to look like this, and then your possible colors and everything like that." Here's here's a second option with a header headline, how we want it to lay out. Third option, and this is what we delivered to them. So after we went through all the prototyping, wireframing, this is actually deliverable that we gave to them before any programming was done. <coughs> Breakpoints. Breakpoints are browser widths that have a media query declaration to change the layout once the browser is within the declared range. Basically, that's where your content is going to change. So if you jump on a responsive website, put it to the outside, and as you drag the browser in, you'll, you'll see the breakpoints happen. You'll see as it moves in, boom, this moved down here. And then you get to another <coughs> breakpoint, oh, it moved down here, and the, the uh, navigation became quite more condensed. Those are breakpoints, that's what happens. There are a minimum of two breakpoints, and that's desktop slash tablet, because uh, many times your site can pretty much display the same as it does as a desktop, as it does on a tablet. But then it breaks, and they have a breakpoint when it goes to mobile. And you need to set the breakpoints according to your content. So let the content drive where things are gonna break. Also explore your design to find the points where it natu naturally will break down and adjust. So you'll also, also be like going through and putting things here and be like, oh, I can see how it automatically would just switch that over here. It, you, sometimes it just feels very synergistic when you are designing and just boom, pops in there. Yes? Now is, is the theory that you're using the, the style tiles or you're using Axure or how are you figuring out how the content's gonna actually look on the devices? Well, that's what I was like, we use Axure. Okay. Um, and the new version of Axure allows you to create a responsive website. It actually does it for you. Obviously with a little with a little love and some of their conditional logic that they have in there, but it's made for it and it gives you all the options and you can set it on there. So what we would do is we would uh, decide, we'd probably start designing with just mobile. And like, okay, we wanna do this. And then we would get into this content and be like, okay, I think we're gonna need a breakpoint for tablet and a separate one for desktop. Or be like, you know what? I think all the content's gonna stay the same as it is on desktop, as it is on ta tablet. It's gonna be the same thing. And that's, I th I'd say it's 50-50 at this point. I've not seen one outweigh the other. It all depends on if we're doing e-commerce site, you know, more transactional. Because with transactional sites, we have a lot more breakpoints. There's a lot more content, a lot more advertisements and things like that. But you get into someone's, you know, maybe they just want a landing page. You know, definitely one breakpoint there. Did that answer your question? Yes. So in Axure, have you, I'm running into this right now. So it doesn't have any fluid grid, so basically it'll only just break as soon as you hit the point. Mm -hmm. And because the break point, it, yeah. yeah, because the break point is the largest width, so let's say I'm gonna do a break point at 768 because I know my audience is on mm -hmm. an iPad tablet. But I'm not gonna break again till 480, so I design in the 768 and then I try to think it through, but I don't want, I'm not going to de design for the smallest break point before I hit that and then it'll go down to that. And I find a lot of wiggle room between there, and sometimes it's a little hard to conceptualize. It is, you're yeah. It, it can be, especially when you're handling just a massive amount of So content. do you still start, do you fake it and do maybe a middle? Yes. Yeah. There's, you there's, pick like in between 768 and 480 yes, and especially you with design Axure, for that because it's not be able to visualize that it'll spread a little bit here and a little bit less yeah, there. Yeah, because it doesn't, because you know, Act, well, Axure doesn't, and I'll get into prototyping a little bit, but actually it doesn't you know, move everything exactly how you want. It fakes it. Right. But it's enough to show a good prototype to a client. 
Right. Yes, that's where we did it. But then we're like, oh wait, this isn't really going to work on the smallest end of this. Yes, it, view. you find that, and that's where you know sometimes I like to have someone jump on a framework and prototype it out on the framework. Right. Um, because it takes a little bit longer, but not much. Because frameworks are already, I'll get into this, have their own predetermined sets that you can use. Um, so a lot of times to show exactly, if we need to show that pixel perfect to get to get sign off, then yeah, I'll have someone do a, do a heavier prototype. Well, most of the time, using Axure, giving that gets it across the board, and then you know we we, we create you know uh, our functional specs require uh, of our requirements, and then um, uh, what we call a CAD, um, the creative. Uh, Remember the A stands for. It's a creative document that we deliver to development that explains everything down to the T. I mean, we are ridiculous about our CADs because they are they are very very descriptive. To we talk about you know if any because many times we'll uh, we do a lot of sites that have a lot of blogs and stuff. So like multiple uh, we're working for Morningstar right now doing their site and we have the um, they have a ton of content. Morningstar is ridiculous amount of content for for what they do. Um, and we like when we go down to the smaller screen, we actually change the gutter sizes too. Mm -hmm. So as we get, so we get, so we go from the desktop, and then we go to the tablet, and we have everything to squeeze in just a tad bit more. Before, rather than just shifting it, we just say like, okay, boom. And then as we go to the phone, then everything just shifts down. So when you talk about like maybe what I've heard called a minor breakpoint, where not as much happens, but I mean, a breakpoint's a breakpoint. It is. You, I mean, you can have as many breakpoints as you want right. because there are so many different screens, right. and sometimes if, with that much content, you need to. Um, so you can say if it changes from you know if you go from 1024 even to 960 you might want it to change. If it goes from 960 to 720 you'll have a change. <clears throat> yeah, you can do that. In your experience, it's just more work. This is uh, you probably won't be able to answer this exactly, but approximately how much time for the dev team gets added on per breakpoint? It would be very situational or, or based on the project. Let's say mid middle yeah. amount of copy, not like a newspaper, and not a brochure. Okay, um, I would say I added 10, 15 to twenty hours probably for each breakpoint. But that's uh, that's I would say that's off a regular developer. If you have a hot shot, someone will probably could whip it out in ten or less. Okay, that gives me a sense anyway. But I, I'm adding in a little QA, a little testing too yeah. into that, not just great development time. Okay. But, okay. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Um, so device breakpoints. Uh, don't ever break at the device at a specific device width. Don't plan on that. There's too many devices to plan on. Go for the main top ones, and you can add more. But when you start doing that, you're gonna you can get you have more um, code, more CSS things you can read through, and obviously. You know, code doesn't add a lot, but if it's heavy, heavy code, if you get more and more code, and, and it's not semantic enough, it can add on more load time. Uh, identify your most important device widths. So pick your top three to five. Uh, classify the devices and set the breakpoints between them. Um, also define breakpoints where your layout breaks. So before even thinking about the devices, just be like, okay, this is where I want to break, and where you want to define the breakpoints uh, where you want the layout to change due to space limitations. Frameworks. This is kind of a skimming over frameworks. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because it's more developer heavy. And I'm trying not to get into that because it could open up a can of worms. Uh, but there are a lot of frameworks. <coughs> They're all a bit different, and you'll have to figure out which is the best for your project or your team or for your working style. But uh, Foundation, I find, is one of the most popular for, that I've had experience with. It's a 12 column nested responsive grid. It doesn't mean your site's going to have 12 columns. You can have any number of columns up to 12 as long as the portions are divisible by 12. I'm not going to do the math for you, but you can see it. Obviously, this presentation will be shared for you, shared with you. <coughs> Here's a site that uses foundation. Uh, once you decide what columns you want, that doesn't have to apply to the whole page. Here they have four columns, three, and three plus three plus three plus three, and right below that, three columns. So you have the top ones with the pictures, and then down here with the copy information. Uh, with Foundation, you know, when you download all the files for, uh, from Foundation, you get CSS, JavaScript, and a sample file, which you can use as a template. Or you can just build your own HTML if you know how. I'm not a coder, 
I would never feel comfortable doing that. So I rely on frameworks because a lot of the work's done for me. But of course, I don't do much hands-on anymore. Also, it's responsive by default. There's only one breakpoint, uh, and the default behavior is for the columns to stack vertically. But you can change it to work however you want by adding more breakpoints or different behavior. Other frameworks, I'm not going to go through each one, but they, uh, I, I put it by <coughs> mostly by, the, by how famous or popular they are. Um, but fra like Frameless really isn't a true framework because you don't download it, but you know these do exist out there. Most of them are <coughs> pretty much free. Wireframes and prototyping, I could go on and on about this because that's probably my deepest part of my behavior with visual design. Rereading, oh, okay. scratching. Okay. Um, and again, shameless plug, Axure. That's actually Axure uh, version 6. I didn't have a screen grab of version 7, but um, it's the coolest tool out there. And it creates an HTML prototype. And like I said, you can pop it on your phone, pop it on your tablet, show clients. It's, it's amazing. Um, also, like I said, frameworks are really great for responsive prototyping because you can build the basic layout very quickly. This is uh, from one of the frameworks that uh, they come with built-in styles for various elements, such as forms and buttons. You probably won't use these basic default styles on your actual design, but they are great for wireframing and prototyping. I keep going back. Uh, they're basic enough that the site will look like a prototype and not a finished design. So you're not going to get in there and be like, wow, this is all a lot of white space and just lines. So you still get that from clients. They sometimes still don't understand the point of wireframing. But I think this is basic enough for you to be like, it's just, we're not talking about colors yet, because you don't want to get them to talk about colors yet. Typography is also included. And then you know, there's, again, I'm not going to get into deep, heavy talk, discussion about prototyping. But that is where you should spend majority of your time is in wireframing and prototyping. I find that visual design should be half that. You should be able to go into visual design and just simply skin it. All the thought, excruciating planning, IA, everything should be done while you're framing prototyping. I live and die by this. Whether you use OmniGraffel, Axure, Joint, Photoshop, Illustrator, hand drawn, I don't care. Whatever works for you, clients, great. Because then your content, your images, and please. If you want to do it at first with Lorem Ipsum, that's fine, but I would I always strongly say get the copy before you go into visual design. It will cause nightmares. I actually, we actually have that in my agreements with my clients. to say, yeah, we will not get to visual design until you give us your copy, yes. You mean all the content? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want pictures. I want, you know, we make sure we have all the pictures sized. To get a sense of it all. Yep, because every, cause then we start laying it in on the wireframe. In Axure, because actually you just import the images. It works great with Photoshop and Illustrator. You can copy and paste right out of it, it Photoshop and Illustrator right into Axure and everything, and it's, it's awesome. Um, also with Axure, you can put in, you can do site, site maps, you can do all your IA in there, and it's very, very easy to use. You can post. The coolest thing about Axure is that you can have an infinite amount of people working on it, because you share a project in one shared location on a VNPN or something, with a shared project, and then you send your changes to that file and everybody else downloads it. And then if you're working on a page, you say, I'm working on it, so you basically turn it off so no one else can work on it at the same time. So yeah, version control. Okay. Yeah, done with my plug in Axure. How do you spell Axure? A-X-U-R-E. And it's only about 600 bucks. Yep, it's not, from raising what it can do, it's not expensive. I, I, have a, I have a visual designer who does everything in there. He touches Photoshop and Illustrator to create the components or like create stuff, but then he just drops it all in there. Because then when you want to create some interaction, because you can create a full working website on there with user settings and everything. And that's what, that's what we'll do. Saves a lot of time. It's called rapid prototyping for a reason. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, the last section I'm going to mainly talk about, because I can't go into the, all the iterations of everything of content and how it's all moved and changed and everything. The main issue is navigation when, it, when you get into websites and, and how it's going to be responsive. So this is the main section I want to finish talking about. Um, and it's probably the trickiest, is, is how you're going to get all the navigation fit on there, especially if you have a really big site. But the good thing is that someone has already figured it out for us. Brad Frost has an excellent website where you can view sample code for different types of things you might want to add to your responsive site, or you can just look at it for inspiration if you're a designer and you're not doing any code. Um, there are also a ton of other links and resources on his page, too. 
but uh, to get right into this, we have the regular top navigation. Very, very convenient, easy, everybody knows it. And it's probably the most known pattern. This is the easiest thing to do navigation too, because it, it generally requires only minimal CSS to make it responsive. So first you go from you know, regular wide top navigation, you see the navigation stays on the same part of the navigation, then it moves down below the logo. So just one selection, boom, down below the logo. It may work if you have only a few options, but if you end up, but if you have, you know, say right here they have five and it fits perfectly. If they had one more, more than likely the text would wrap. So all of a sudden they'd contact us and they had another section of uh, news or something, that would drop down below. So then you'd have five up there and then one down here at the left side. You're like, that looks weird. Um, so this site has a lot of different navigations and navigation items. I really don't like what they, stayed, what they did in a second because you'll see why. They use a strategy of keeping all the nav items at the top. But what happens is they end up filling the whole screen with navigation and you can't see any of the content. People aren't coming to your website to look at your navigation. They're coming for the content, so it's not good. <laughs> Footer anchor navigation is also fairly simple to implement. This is a contents magazine and this is what the site looks like on a desktop, a basic horizontal navigation. And on a small screen, instead of seeing navigation at the top, you see a button which says explore. You click this to get to the navigation and it's an anchor link. So when you click it, you navigate to the bottom of the page where the navigation is. The problem is with this, is that's disorienting to the user to jump around on the page. But, you know, you go into a page, eh, it's okay. But it's, it's something to use. I wouldn't say it's the best, I wouldn't say it's the worst. It's an option. Yes. Sorry, you call it footer what? <coughs> anchor, footer anchor. Footer anchor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, putting an anchor in the code. So when they click that button, it just scrolls the page up <coughs> or scrolls down. Which one do you want to say? <laughs> Toggle navigation. Uh, this is one of you seeing it all over the place. Everybody's loving it because it gives the most options. Facebook, as soon as Facebook, I saw that Facebook and Google Plus implement it, so, so I see it everywhere. Starbucks website. You have the three line icon in the top right. That means navigation. It's a fairly common convention. And when you click it, you get the navigation and the rest of the page content is pushed down or sometimes to the left or right. So the navigation does not overlap the content. Also has media queries to put the nav items either in one or two columns depending on how much width is available. And when you click the X, the navigation will disappear and the content will go back to its normal spot. Left nav flyout. This is pretty much what Facebook created. I did not see anybody before. If anybody saw one before, please tell me. Like the previous example, there's an icon at the top of the horizontal bars, and to click the navigation, you see basically the page and content move over to the right, sometimes left, uh, instead of down. And then you would click the navigation icon again to go back to the content, and you see it over on the right. You can also have the sub menus within the navigation. A very excellent solution. It's probably one we use, utilize the most. Three-dimensional menu. We've only used this once. Basically, it's that. You see the narrow arrow, the arrow over on the left side of the screen. You, you click, you would click that, and it would bring in basically move pay the content you have and kind of put it back. Like set back that way, in a, not really setting it back to make it look like that. You can do, you can also do it by you uh, do it by using swipe, but that's not very intuitive. People don't usually go to a website thinking that they can swipe to get the navigation. So again, it's a new convention. That's how it looks on the mobile device. It's okay. I'd like to see what people can come with with new code. All right, I'm going to end again. Content, content, content. There are no major practices that everybody uses as a best practice. There's no, there's plenty of books out there. Everybody will say something. But it's when you're doing responsive, just know that you're creating your own puzzle that you need to <coughs> You're not getting a puzzle that's already there for you. You're creating, you're creating the pieces, and then now you need to figure out where they're going to go backwards. So use the layouts, plan. Wireframe, 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 prototype, prototype, and communicate with your clients, and you will be successful.
<laughs> so uh, resources that you can look at when you get the website or get the PowerPoint that I have. Um, and also, I say follow me on Twitter. I don't tweet a ton. I do most of my stuff on LinkedIn, which I didn't put on here. But you can reach me on one of those two uh, emails, and my LinkedIn is just Ryan Dodd. Okay. Thank you very keep much. Keep that, keep that up. Sure, no problem. And um, now is question and answer. Yes. Uh, for those of us that don't have access to Azure, any other recommendations? You can download for, it for a month. What, I mean, it, we're a small shop. We can't afford that tool, and most of the designers we work with don't use it either. Okay. Um, I mean, for I mean, you obviously have Illustrator. Mm -hmm. Illustrator, I find, is probably the best thing to do because you can create a symbol library and share that. And that's what I did before we actually year, years ago. Um, but I understand it's a small shop; it can be that can be cost prohibitive. Um, I I always go back to Illustrator. But I actually web design in Illustrator. I don't do it in Photoshop. Okay. I'm weird. I like using because they would Illustrator when you create an artboard and you save that Illustrator file as a PDF. All those artboards become pages. It does all the work for you, of exporting everything. So I find it easier to work with vectors and everything in Illustrator. I I worship Illustrator. I'm married if I could. <laughs> Yes. Is there a website where you can look at the different devices? Do you know what? There, um, there are websites, but also on, let me bring up, uh, Chrome is a great tool, an add-on on a Chrome, and that you can do a resolution test. So you bring up the website. Uh, so you just go to Chrome and then ask for resolution test? No, uh, well, you can look at it. It's an add-on. Yeah, it's an add-on. Yeah, so when I click that, I say, I want to set my page to all oh, these different sure. sizes. Uh -huh. And so I'm going to go down 640 by 480 is the minimum for any Android or uh, iPhone, and it sets it automatically to that. Oh, so then it sets? It, it sets your browser, it changes your browser directly to that size. It sets the browser to that size. OK, so it's resolution test? Yeah, that, that's what I use. But there's a ton of different, there's a million different websites out there. I mean, I think there I think there's just one called responsive.com. There's a responsinator. Responsinator. And if you pay six bucks a month, you can set up all your own. There's, like, there's free ones. And, but yeah. Yeah, they're responsive. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, Chrome just added uh, emulation into the browser. If you go to the yes. My, one of my developers was showing that to me. Thank you. Um, yeah, Chrome added. Actually, you can buy. You can get them free too. Um, you can get emulators that actually are the iOS or Android, they're the functioning software on your computer. So you can load up a test website on your computer through that emulator, see how it's going to perform. Bad thing is emulators aren't perfect, they're, they don't go for, they don't satisfy <coughs> hardware, they don't satisfy bandwidth, they don't, sat, they don't satisfy those speed tests. Great for looking at how your website looks at, but don't rely on it for speed because you're going off your whatever speed you're plugged into on your or your Wi-Fi, not through a 3G. Yes. Have you had any experience with the uh, Inspect plugin for Chrome? Yeah, I use Inspect all the time. Um, when I get because uh, I like because well, I don't do any coding when I'm on a project. Um, I'll have my uh, well, I'll go to the dev site and I'll load up Firebug to view the code. Um, and just look at things. Because what's great about Firebug is that you can select an element on the web page. I mean, a lot of people probably know this. I see some people with some nods. But you can select an <coughs> element on the web page, change the code in Firebug, or there's other add-ons. Change the code and it'll change the website for what you see. It doesn't change it, really, really change it. It just changes what you see. So you can jump on there. I'll jump in there and be like, hey, I want to change the CSS. Like, I want to see what it looks like in a lot of preview. What? To preview it. Yes. Yeah, so if I be like, I, I want I want to see what it looks like when it does this, I want to see if it work better, then I put that in and it'll work. Can you just look at a page on the re uh, resolution test and not a URL? Uh, what do you mean a page? page? What type of mean a page? Is uh, a page a URL? A page instead of the whole website. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can anything you, anything you pop up in a browser, okay. that's what it's used for. Okay, oh, yeah. great. Thanks. He was first. <laughs> Uh, I do a lot of e-commerce, and okay. you had mentioned that that's um, one of the more challenging ones. Do you have any, um, do you, would you suggest any examples of uh, something you think is done really well? What I mean, the concept that I'm trying to think. you brought um, across? Or? That actually just asked for me. I sent that to a client of when we did at Slideworks. I'd have to get back to you on that one. I can't, off the top of my head, I'm like, 
one that really popped off is awesome because I think Amazon's freaking ridiculous. I think they actually don't. I think they put too much content in front of people, um, but they're not responsive either. So mm. they're adaptive, not responsive. They don't go all the way down to mobile. Yeah. Um, I'll email you. Yes, please right. do. That's. <laughs> I was asked that. I like. Why can't I remember that? Because I, I just had to put that together. Said that to a client when we did. So I'll. Yeah. Email me. I'll send that to you. We actually won some awards for that one. Uh, is this going to, um, is Recosta going to work well with uh, Google Glass with the different angulations? Excellent question. We just bought three of them and we've had good success, actually. Um, we've been testing on Google Glass for about, when did we buy those? It was before I came to SiteWorks. I've only been there for a few months. But we, we tried one at TravelClick, but I we we didn't do a lot of sponsor there. I brought that product to them, so. I don't have a good answer for that, but I know we've tested and I've, I know we've had good results. But I was not involved with that. That was before my time there. But that's a good question. I, have, I can get I can get you some some of that testing back. Some results. Yes. I apologize if you mentioned this. Are the slides available anywhere? Is what? Are your slides available? Yes, I'll make them available. I think she will. Yeah, okay. he'll give me the slide share link. Yeah. And I'll I was literally I created this this morning. <laughs> No. Thank you. I, yeah, I want to. I finish it at four thirty. So. Yes. Typography. Well, I use the hell out of Google, uh, Google Web Fonts, but um, most of the time, you know, this is definitely utilizing a lot of CSS three to make sure to, in resizing. Is that what you're asking for? Is that I mean that's really because yeah. it's either like looking at the content and either having text disappear and have it be like three or four words and then dot 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 learn more or something like that we, we do that a lot but then on a desktop you see a bigger chunk um, most of the time you can you definitely can shrink down to a point 10 comfortably on a phone I, I want to say that I may want to double check that number but it's pretty you can go lower than you can on a desktop well, so I'm also thinking about uh, optimal line length. So with a flexible viewport, you may not be able to maintain optimal line length if you're too long, too short. And uh, it's a challenge keeping the type and proportion of the line length. So look at it. Yeah, that, I don't think I have a good answer for that one. I have to think about that. That's, usually when I get those type of questions, I'm always like, I look to my developer on my right side. Give me an answer. <laughs> but uh, if, if anybody wants to email any questions, that if I don't answer right now, I can definitely get you an answer pretty quick. Yes. Sorry, I was looking at it. Uh, one of my main irritations on a lot of websites is that the website starts pinging, and you try and click on something, but because uh, an ad is loading, it shifts the content. Yes, ads. They, or that, the page is un, doesn't respond until all the ads load. Yes. So you're waiting 10, 20 seconds for stupid ads to load. Yeah, that, you know, that's many times communication with a third party, especially with the load times and what type of ad um, and how they created it. Many, but what we try to do when we come up with that, especially with ads, is planning for ahead of time and we give the third party a certain level of standards, being like, you have to be within this size, optimize image this way. And that's when we would develop the website, we give that to the client saying, if, you know, if we're not managing it, be like, they have to follow these rules or else something's gonna get messed up. And, and when you mess on it? What? Does that include an SLA? Server agreement, like uh, yeah. a certain time that they have to respond to? That's a good question. I haven't encountered that yet. Do you have pages where ads are like, you know, 10 seconds before yep. they fill? And I have seen that. And that's, you know, incredibly aggravating. Yeah, again, I'm not sure if there's a solution to that yet, because that's well, many times third party or someplace else they've hired to come up with those ads, working yeah. with an ad company like Versa Media or something like that. And they create those, and then you just give space for it. And I would think you could load those asynchronous. There should allow the page to yeah. There should yeah. operational. Well, as I would, load in the yeah, well, could you, there should be a way to have the page load and then call. Yeah, there those is. Those ads, yeah. So I think that would be the it. best way to do it, so that they don't come up first. Right, I just stop seeing those sites. <laughs> That's that's a good point, but uh, I think there's some workarounds of that. Uh, main thing is covering your butt, being like if they're going to load this, they have to create it this way, and you give that to the client. You know, so make sure to give them everything and anything. 
because then, then they'll appreciate they'll they'll, they'll appreciate you. Well, my dream is to create a browser where any page element doesn't load in a second. I think every designer wants to, or developer wants to build their own <laughs> then browser. Then make it asynchronous and let the page execute. That would be nice. Because <laughs> she already raised, but I don't, you guys can play over it. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the difference between adaptive and responsive? You brought yeah. that up. And uh, adaptive, why you would choose which one? Adaptive isn't truly responsive. Adaptive uses a f you know, fluid layout so that as you're moving, things do go out. But it, it, it's adapting to where the browser is going, and it only goes past. It only goes to a certain point, usually 960. Which, if people know, if you're a designer, you don't design at 1024 because you have to account for crap on the outside, like the scroll bar and stuff like that. So you design for 960. Um, then would you have different templates though? So like, doesn't it ping the agent to say what? this is a mobile device? So do, do yeah, well, this? what we've done is using Axure because you can do you can set yeah. things to the browser. So we actually show how it's going to show when it goes to, if you want to take it to your screen on a you know, huge resolution screen, you can go all over the right side and it, you know, it'll be adaptive and fluid. But like adaptive is thrown around, I think the real world of the word is a fluid and not fixed website. That's, That's the way why I'm I, like still trying to like yeah. read. You have your now fixed website. Like, I still don't quite exactly get the nuance of some yeah. of this. So, Going over that, you have your your fixed website, which is just everything right there. You know, if you open it up on a big resolution yeah. screen, you have gutters. You have empty space on the right side, and everything fits within 960. Though we're starting to see the minimum screens now are 12, 12, 1280. 12, I was going to say 12, 80, but I was, for some reason I thought that was wrong. Yeah, 12, 80. So soon, hopefully, we'll start to be able to design to the minimum of 12, 80. Okay. But I've, I'll give another five years for that. Um, I just read something that said 1366. <laughs> I know. It's it's, like, well, before we had the browser wars, now we have the screen wars. But um, <laughs> so, it, adaptive is strictly. I think someone just started calling it that. I just I call it fluid, a fixed, fluid, responsive. Those are my three things that I we, we, that we usually build. And most of the time, I, I like I can't remember the last time we built a fixed site. It's usually responsive or at least fluid, which again the minimum it goes to is for a 1024 by screen, and then as you get bigger, which, like, go to Amazon, that's what they are. Right? There's just gets, it adds more content as you have a bigger screen. I see people are getting up to go. <laughs> I, think, yeah, I thought Adaptive kind of hits a point, you know, and then yeah. you hit another point, you right. know, instead right. of being a total fluid thing. Well, know? that's why, that's where Responsive came in to take over for that. Yeah. Now Adaptive is kind of like, we don't know what it is. Um, it's just there because now we have responsive. So again, they're buzzwords. I really can't tell you what adaptive is other than what I've learned it is. Someone else may completely say something different. Because so. responsive seems to be responsive is everything down. Yeah, everything, yeah. And that's the way to go. Adapt. Yeah. Now I say adaptive. If anybody, if they ask for that, I always say, "What do you mean?" <laughs> yeah. I get that from a client. Like we want an adaptive site. Okay. What do you think that yeah. is? I've like, <laughs> heard that somewhere. Yeah. What do you want? What, what do you want to adapt to? You know, you need like a voltage adapter. Yeah. You mentioned HTML5 sliders. Yes. Are there any HTML5 or CSS3 features that you're finding really uh, help Bad. in a significant way? Um, I well, just just text usage. Of having of not being not needing to put the text on an image, where we can change it using HTML5 creates a lot better, especially if there's a um, like a misspelling. Boom, you just change it in the code. It's done. Rather than going to the designer, getting them to change it, save it out, optimize it, load it back up. Boom, done. Now, you know that's that's what I find is HTML5 sliders because you can do you can do animations and do all all sorts of stuff all using code, which is a you know an interaction or web designer dream. So that's why I love HTML5 CSS3. Brown slash one. Don't keep going. I'm, um, you I'm a babysitter enough? tonight. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not planning on I'm good. Uh, in terms of JavaScript, you can, at a certain point, we're executing so much JavaScript that slows down. Yes, I find JavaScript can be heavy. Um, and when I say heavy, load time or just slows down the, 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 the page, load, uh, page functionality just, just makes things slower, yes. Too much JavaScript can. And that's when I when I hire, I check to make sure that they design lean. I like to see very very lean code, semantic 
you know, the semantics you can get. Because that will save us. Does everyone know what semantic is? I don't need to go into that. If anybody wants me to go into this, forever hold your peace. No? Okay. Briefly? What? Briefly? Semantic? Basically, you make it, you do the code so that if you change something here, and that instance exists over here, it changes there too. So you're not going to different places and changing it several different places. You change it once and it changes across the board. So on an enterprise site, when you have, you know, the, the pages are endless because they have landing pages, all these other things that are getting created dynamically by a million different people in the company, you know, the, the, the change could be huge. If you have to change one thing and it exists in several different instances, then that is bad and you will get fired. But you have an external style sheet though, right? Yeah. That, that, that is an a instance of a semantic type of coding, is using, is doing style sheets correctly. You can do them bad. Keep going. No, no. Uh, what are the most popular JavaScript frameworks for response? I am not the best JavaScript expert. I mean, just frameworks. And where do you see used? I would not. I would not be the person that I not. I don't even. I can't remember the last framework that I utilized. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I've been a director for too long. <laughs> now I just kind of rely on everything for that. Yes. What are your you name? Some of your favorite yeah. sliders. People who make your favorite sliders. Um. Dang. Oh. There's one that I actually. Let's show how slider. Um. Email me that one. Because I I have a list that we actually just sold to a client, but I don't remember their names. Yeah. Yes. Did you say foundation had one breakpoint? You said something had one breakpoint. Out of the box, but one you can break. create more. Yes. Got one breakpoint. Yeah, and just 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 a mobile. Uh, but you can add you can add more. It's very very uh, customizable. Yes. And are, are those sliders also good across the board for mobile and? Yes. I yeah. Uh, HTML5, you sh you're fine. Okay. Um, all all phones now except HTML5, and I suggest using them too because mm. the code is a lot better. The loads faster. One more question. Sure. Um, because brothers accept a lot have a lot more time faces now. Do you you still use a lot of custom th faces through Go Google Fonts, right? Uh, you were saying. I am a font Nazi. Um, sorry if that's offending. I'm sorry. Um, I don't. I like to them the key stay underneath five fonts and not to do anything incredibly crazy. I'm sorry. You what? I stay underneath five fonts. We do use Google Web Fonts, but they have to get approval if they're going to use anything type of weird font. And I usually that approval comes to me, especially on a big client, mm -hmm. because you mean can, it, it can. It, I've, I've seen it at load time. I've seen it, even though it's a web font. I've seen it still not load correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so I. So you don't use them that much. We we do, but we test and test and test them. If okay. they're going to use something crazy or something that's not known, some weird signature font, we test the crap out of it before we decide to use it. Actually, there are emulators and things you can get. There's um something that one someone just brought to my attention that we are looking at using that you can test. It's like it's basically like a, it's a website emulator that you can test how the font's going to look on right. every single browser. So it just links to it, shows you the load time, shows you how it looks. Because we've had issues where it, the kerning lighting was different, so that all right, so that it knocked off the design mm -hmm. when that was actually launched. And we, we got to out, when we got to beta, we're like, that's not cool. I'm gonna grab some water. My voice is a little uh, hoarse. Anything else? Yes. Any issues with uh, CSS three uh, <laughs> or CSS in general? Uh, big processors and working with responsive design. Uh, we haven't. <coughs> yeah, you get a little deeper than I know. Do dev stuff. Usually, I rely on uh, my uh, technology manager. Um, Always I ask because it's SASS. What's that? SASS. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. I know that comes up many times in our conversations. Yeah. So I know we use that, <laughs> but that's that's all about all I know. You, you do apps as well. Yes, we do apps. Do you use Sentia Architect or Sentia Touch or no? We, we, we utilize PhoneGap a lot. So we do everything HTML5 and then PhoneGap, but we don't do native iOS. And that saves time because then you can do the same thing for Android and iPhone and then use PhoneGap. But that's what Sentia does too. 
I just did say I don't know that. Okay. I just know phone. I just use phone gap because it's the one that does. Okay. Use it's it's free. Yeah. So anything for free. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for coming. Give me a card. I'm not sure. I don't want to check your I don't. earrings. Oh, you know. I'm so new they don't give me a card yet. But I can write down my information. We found one. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I just want to check that I got your email. I was trying not to go too fast, but there's so much I wanted to cover, but then so much I didn't want to cover. Yeah. Okay, good. Is, is this uh, it? Ryan D. Dot. Dot. So D. -O.